Total Three. A live podcast sponsored by the Marin Fire History Group. All about the history of the fire service in Marin County, California. And now your host, retired fire chief Bill Lewis. Good day, and welcome to the Marin County Fire Chief's historical website. Today, it is my pleasure to introduce you to the history of the Locksboro Volunteer Fire Department. These men and women gave over 120 years of dedicated service to their neighbors. It is my pleasure to have walked in their footsteps for the past 61 years. In the last cent, uh, part of the 19th century, all fire departments in Marin County were volunteer. Most of us were organized after the disastrous fire came through the communities and the community would organize its fire department. Here, the first one was San Rafael in 1874, were formed. No Valley came in 1890 after fires on Mount Tam. Larkspur came in in 1897 after a major hotel burnt down. San Anselmo in 1907, a large fire in Sausalito. In 1909, after another fire on Mount Tamalpais. Locksburg is only 13 miles from San Francisco, a short ride on the ferry boat, and you're in Sausalito. And welcome to the Marin County's train depot in Sausalito. Here you would catch a train that would take you to Locksburg. Uh, if you wanted to, you could go as far as Point Ray Station. Once you were on the train, you could go to and stop at the Baltimore station in Larkspur. And from that station, within 30 minutes, you could be camping inside the Redwoods on the banks of Royal Holland Creek. If you rode the train a few half mile further, you would get off at Larkspur, where you could register at the Larkspur Hotel, which was the place to be seen in those days. How it all came to be. The year is 1847. The gold rush is in its height. And Locksburg was called Corte Madeira at the time. Corte Madeira refers to the term cut wood. So in 1848, a group of gentlemen from Baltimore, Maryland, decided to invest in a lumber mill on the slopes of Mount Tamalpais. This is a typical lumber mill operation in the Baltimore Canyon in 1848. The Baltimore and Frederick Mining and Trading Company would bring over 400 lumbermen into this small hamlet. Many would stay here and make Larkshire their home. In 1887, after the lumber mill moved its to Point San Quentin, a gentleman by the name of Charles William Wright purchased the 600 acres of what is today Old Town Locksburg. He built a beautiful hotel on, the, on Sycamore Ave in 1891. Sadly, in 1894, it burnt to the ground. It went up in ashes. There was a bucket brigade of men and women from Locksburg, but the fire was beyond their ability to control. So, it's, so they lost the battle, and the, 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 the hotel was removed and never rebuilt. This is Wright's, 
This is Lynch's Hall. It's a parking lot next to the Blue Rock Hotel, but it's where the volunteers had a meeting that decided their future. The chairman of the committee in Larkspur was so concerned about fire protection, he commented once that I would be penniless if my home caught fire. It was a concern for the citizens and Mr. the right. If people were to come and purchase homes in Larkspur, they had to have fire protection. So on that, that evening at Mites Hall, he dedicated a lot to building of the first fire station in Larkspur. So as you can see, uh, in 1813 men would step forward to produce, protect the fellow citizens from the ravages of fire. The Larkspur volunteers are born. This is their first firehouse, as referred to by Mrs. Dolph Doherty, a shack. But it was some place to keep their buckets and future hose carts and chemical engines. In those days, the fire protection for the city were buckets. These buckets were probably three gallons each. And the challenge to this romantic way of fighting fires is each of these full buckets weighs about 25 pounds. So you should attempt to fill a bucket of water and see how far you can throw it up against a, an imaginary building. So the bucket brigade really was ineffective. It was more of holding the fire in check until people could remove their belongings. Of course, in April of 1906, the San Andreas Fault activated, and this is why many people came back to Larkspur. In the canyons of Larkspur, there were many summer homes. These summer homes were like two rooms surrounded by open porch, and after the quake, those citizens would come to Larkspur and make their permanent residence here, uh, never to return to the city again. The first boost of day parade, Diane's, was raised over $700 in those days to buy hose carts and other needed equipment. And in this picture, you can see a chemical hose cart in the lower right hand corner. So, but $700 in today's market is well over $10,000. The host cut was the first mobile line of suppression. It could carry a thousand feet of hose and weigh over 600 pounds, and it cost $400. They were manufactured in San Francisco. For $250, a local teamster named J.B. Rice would pull the host cut along with as many citizens that could get on board. To, many times men would fall off and have the hose cart run over them, breaking bones. Osher is still 75 years away. The invention of the chemical engine changed the course of firefighting in America. America fell in love with these chemical engines that could produce pressure at 125 pounds and throw a, ste a steam of chemical of water almost 100 feet. It was a very dangerous operation because if you added the wrong chemicals and filled it too much, the tank could explode, injuring or killing the operator. These men trained dil diligently on usually on a Saturday, and here they are at the hotel uh, practicing bringing that hose line from the chemical engine to the top floor of the hotel. Uh, they were very dedicated people, and they need to have uh, how to operate these chemicals. This is a typical scene in the Marin in Corte Madera, Larkspur. The hose cuts and chemical engines were normally placed in one or two spots. In Larkspur, we had a firehouse on Magnolia, and we had a firehouse up the Madrone Canyon that during the flood stages, the firehouse would move and they'd have to go retrieve it and bring it back. But this was the typical fire suppression operation at the turn of the century. 
that it, the volunteers through dances, this is how they raise most of their money, is have a dance on Saturday at some hall in the community, and they would buy a double cylinder chemical engine, would help pull it, and what they would do is they would, and citizens were encouraged to step up and grab the tether and help pull the apparatus to the fire. The tether was probably 18 to 20 feet long. Here we see the building of the first volunteer fire station that was going to be on the Doherty Lumberyard, which is on Magnolia, of the 500 block of Magnolia Ave. If you look at the far left middle of the picture, you can see a sign, this is your fire department being built, telling the citizens that their concerns were addressed. So the second firehouse, you can see the fire alarm bell is on the building, and we had a pole station at the corner of Ward and Magnolia. And in those days, that bell could be heard throughout the community. And you can see they had ladders and garden hoses, and they had hose and rakes. The common threat to most communities that lived at, at the base of Mount Zion Pires was fires on the mountain. The earliest reporting of a fire on Mount Tam is in 1852, and from a, a hose a letter from Nevada telling that there was a great deal of lumber destroyed. But these fires were a constant threat to all of us, including Larkspur. And you can see in this image, they are backfiring, using fire to fight fire. We call that backfire. And women were alongside men fighting the fire. Here we see Jim and watching the fire in 1881. A gentleman by the name of William Pixley was clearing his land when, when the fire got out of control, destroying over 65,000 acres. When Mr. Pixley saw what he had happened, he dropped dead and died at the scene of the fire. This is a fire that threatened the Madrone Canyon, Baltimore Canyon. The gentleman to the far right is a volunteer from Larkspur, Mr. Frizzy. On July 1929, the last great fire on the mountain came with 30 mile an hour winds. She was a devil fire. Volunteers had to run for their lives when the fire turned back on itself. Their hoses and rakes with no contest for this fire. Let's meet some of the, those early men who stepped forward to lead these their fellow volunteers in Larkspur. The department's chief's position was elected each December, and they would serve voluntarily for 12 months. A total of 13 men would hold the position of the fire chief for Larkspur from 1897 to 1959. A gentleman by the name of Harry Hopkins in 1897 at that first meeting at Wrights Hall came to be the very first fire chief awarded the title of chief engineer. The term engineer comes about in the fire service when the steam engine was introduced. Hopkins was also a station agent for the North Pacific Coast Railroad Company and he helped promote community awareness surrounding the lack of fire protection. Frank Ambrose, in 1908, a local painter, saw his paint shop go up in flame during the San Francisco Great Fire of 1906. Larkspur offered a haven for this refuge on one of Ambrose's first administrative act was to introduce and pass an ordinance making it a misdemeanor and to maliciously and mischievously ring the town bell for other than for fire or church services. Kids will be kids even in 1908. Mr. Chief Barnes in 1909, little is known of this chief, only that he came from the Santa Rosa area, but his image 
his submitted the le legacy is organized the first Booster Day celebration in Larkspur in 1909, bringing over $700 for their purchase of equipment. Chief Evanson was a member of the San Francisco Fire Department. He retired as a captain in 1926, and he held the Larkspur Fire Chief's position for six years. He would become the first paid chief of the volunteer fire department. From this point forward, most of the fire chiefs would come out of the San Francisco fire department. Henry Geister had one of the most compelling stories, starting his career as a ho horseman at Engine Company Number no. Four in San Francisco. He also experienced enormous personal tra trauma. In 1910, his son Raymond was run over and killed by a truck that lost its brakes. As his wife looked on, Geister picked up his critically injured three-year-old son and ran a mile to St. Joseph's Hospital, where his son was pronounced dead. In 1928, Chief Geister would retire from the position of San Francisco as a battalion chief after 28 years of service. One of his sons would later serve as the Larkspur Volunteers president, Mel Geister. In 1916, the volunteers purchased their first motorized chemical engine, a Henry Ford Model T. It was built in San Anselmo at a cost of $1,195. The next major piece of apparatus they bought was a Stutz. 1923, 350 gallons per minute engine. Uh, when this was purchased, they had to hire a, tr a training officer to teach the volunteers how to drive a triple combination pumper. Here the, you can see the engine is being tested from a draft and is what now the College of Marin Athletic Field in North Larkspur. If you have the opportunity to see a rebuilt, refurnished Stutz fire engine, Chief Smog Bob Moncucci and his brother Marty have restored this San Rafael engine to the day it came off the, the assembly line in Indianapolis, Indiana. It's a beautiful apparatus, and it's what the Larkspur engine looked at the Larkspur engine only pumped 350, but this is a 750 a gallon per minute pumper. Larkspur, would, with all the money they were getting from dances, would buy the most modern fire equipment available. Here we have an American La France built in Elmira, New York in 1927. It was a thousand gallon per minute positive displacement pump. Uh, it has been uh, completely restored. When we sold it, we sold it to a band that used to drive around Candlestick Park at the 49er games. It has now been completely restored in this up in Placer County, California. The last engine the volunteers would buy was a 1946 American La France, 500 gallon per minute centrifugal pump the order was placed in 1944, but due to the war effort, the engine wasn't delivered till 1946. The volunteers had a moment in the sun, and that happens when Collier's Magazine, a Saturday evening publication that had six million copies sold, showed the United States what the volunteers were all about. And the, the whole theory behind the volunteers was fire protection without taxation. In the magazine, they show that here we see when the horn sounded, volunteers were responsible to respond to the, in, to the station. Here we see volunteer Buddy Anthony. He had to leave the barber chair. The three McLaren brothers, uh, Rufus, set 
aside for a fire. Brother Ralph is jumping from the window. Ralph would go on to be the Kentville fire chief. The brother Robert is running down the plank and Charles is on the roof. Charles would take over the position of fire chief and president of the volunteers in 1927. With all the funds, the volunteers had spent no cost. The first alarm came when a bell tower at the Roman Catholic Church on the corner of Rice Lane and Kane Street. Again, we talked about the volunteers were responsible for maintaining the bell, the, the tower, and all the ropes. The middle picture is the first fire alarm that was on the corner of Magnolia and Ward. And later on, they put in a modern Gamewell fire alarm system. So it, the system fire alarm box is now only a few blocks from any home in town. This is where the, 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 the numbers were placed on a hook. The hook was pulled and it was sound the box alarm and the tape. A funny thing about that tape is the insurance company made them go from punching a hole to punching a diamond shape hole so they could read it in the right direction. It was the first step because they didn't trust the fire department to roll the tape up for the underwriters, insurance companies, to come in and evaluate the fire department's fire protection. The gentleman we will talk about in part two is a gentleman chief, well, Dolph Torrey. He is a gentleman for all seasons, 1880 to 1959. Dolph was elected chief president in 1913, a post he would hold until 1954. He built the Rose Bowl dance platform, station 15 on Magnolia Ave, and purchased the most current equipment for its time. His statement was, if it's good enough for New York, it's good enough for Larkspur. And he lived to that, that quality. Being a member of the new organization of volunteers considered to be a privilege, and membership was in high demand. The uniforms were always worn with great pride at parades and hose cart races. It was a fashion statement, and those who wore it were instantly recognized within the community with great admiration. The first Locksburg Volunteers uniform was distinct red button with white red breast and white buttons, a bow tie, black trousers with a belt that could hold a spanner if needed. I want to thank you for taking, uh, watching part one of the history of the Locksburg Volunteers and be safe. And now I will ask our director, producer, do we have any questions? We do, oh great one, I'm glad you brought that up as a matter of fact. Um, before we ask, go for questions, could you perchance look into, gaze into your crystal ball and tell us what might be coming up in the future on the website. Do we have new people, perhaps? Yes, we do. That is a very good observation on your part. It's very different for the day. <laughs> it is, yes. Yes. Uh, we have a, uh, a couple of gentlemen, uh, Greg Jennings and Pete Martin, both retired Marin County fire personnel who are in the process of writing the history of the Marin County Fire Department. We have another gentleman by the name of Jim, Chief Jim Parrott, who is writing the history of the Sausalito Fire Department. Uh, Chief Jim Irving, you know, we hope to write the history of the uh, Alto Fire Department and Tano Pines Fire Departments. And Jeff, we hope, will write the history of the Mill Valley Fire Department. We will be doing interviews with the Fire Brigade in San at the Skywalker Ranch doing their history, and we have a number of other um, people in the community that were important to our history that will be videotaping. So stay tuned, a lot's coming down the road. And it's been a lot of fun uh, recording and documenting our history. 
Anything else, Mr. Director, producer? You know, I thought you'd never ask. We have a question to ask the chief. Yeah. This one comes to us from Joe and, now get ready for this, comes to us from Joe and Isabella in Sweden. They actually found us here from Sweden and they have reached out with a question. Say they're interested in getting in touch with relatives of two Marin County fire chiefs. They call them Chiefs Johansson. Marty Johansson, 1873 to 1932, and Fritz Johansson, Clarence, 19, or 1895 to 1965. How interesting was that? Do you know any Johansons? I have some uh, information here from our leader, Chief Marcucci. Uh, no, what I, what I could find is the first chief in the turn of the century. Uh, again, like San Rafael elected his chiefs on the, in December of each year. So you, one year would be chief, you would be the fire chief, and maybe two years later you'd be uh, a zone chief in charge of a hose cart or a chemical engine. Uh, the first chief is just mostly newspaper articles involving the, the election of officers and the placement of men around the San Rafael. Uh, for his son, Fritz, uh, we have pictures of him that you're going to be sending out, I hope, of uh, yes. standing in front of an uh, <clears throat> artificial war wall uh, at, uh, in uh, San Rafael when they were making movies. Also a picture of Fritz as chief of the apartment in, when Station 2 opened in 1961. And uh, you will be sending it off to Sweden. So they are watching. and. Uh, I'll have to probably put a lot of postage on that to get it to Sweden. Probably. Yeah. Probably. Chief Marcucci, our editor-in-chief here, uh, looked at this. He, was the re he is the retired chief of San Rafael Fire. And he sent me this information to pass on. Uh, he sent a picture of the grand opening of Fire Station 2, and that would have been in 1958. Oh. Chief Fritz Johansson well. is in that picture. Uh, Chief Marcucci said that from uh, Chief Johansson in 1961, Chief Van Strivet became chief, and then Chief Marcucci. So it was a pretty long cycle of, of fire chiefs. But Chief Marcucci says he was a uh, pretty much a low-key guy. And here is one little aside that Bob sent us. Um, Bob's father, Nello Marcucci, the fire chief of San Anselmo, uh, his helmet was stolen from his car just uh, before retirement. And Chief Johansson gave Chief Marcucci, Chief Nello Marcucci, his helmet to wear until he retired. And Chief Bob Marcucci has the helmet still today. How's that for a bit of history? That's very nice. Nice piece of history there, Mr. Producer Director. So we can say goodbye for the day. We, we will do that. We will say goodbye and please be safe. And how big should our fires be? As small as possible. Keep them all small, Keep right? Keep them small. That's Here correct. Here we go. Thank you.